Last January, reporting on the State of the Union, President Nixon called for revenue sharing, which he described as the giving of money by the federal government to the individual states. It is reported that the first comment on the proposal by Congressman Wilbur Mills was, quote, revenue sharing isn't anything but a gratuity in a will signed by a pauper. A shrewd observer's concluded from that comment alone, made as it was by the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, that President Nixon's plan was stone dead. Wilbur Mills has often been called the most powerful man in Congress. His influence derives not only ex officio as chairman of Ways and Means, he is said to be intellectually flexible and a tirelessly effective politician who knows the mood of Congress as keenly as Boswell knew the mood of Johnson. Every high school graduate in his district in Arkansas receives a congratulatory letter from Wilbur Mills so that every election he is sent back Usually nobody bothers to run against him. When he was first elected in 1938, he was at age 29, the youngest representative in the House. Before running, he was a probate judge. Before that, he graduated from the Harvard Law School. I should like to begin by asking Mr. Mills why, A, is the government a pauper, and B, who pauperized it? Let me take the first question first, if I may. Uh, I think it's a combination of misunderstanding, perhaps, on one hand, of what the people really want uh, by the Congress that uh, must, of course, uh, authorize the expenditures of every dollar that is spent. Uh, the executive departments cannot spend anything that the Congress hasn't authorized. So you have to put the finger, really, on Congress. But bear in mind that Congress has always, before it, innumerable requests that come from the chief executive and departmental heads uh, for programs uh, or additions to programs. One of the big factors uh, is the growth in the cost of government as population grows, as population moves to uh, more urban centers. But as population all, grows, so does income grow, right? So yes, that, that's, that's true. A, that should be a wash. That's true, but your costs go faster. Why? Uh, I don't know why. I've never been able to figure it out. But your costs of programs will rise faster if you do not exercise a great degree of surveillance than will your revenues. Uh, your revenues may go up five or six billion dollars a year in a growing economy, but <clears> invariably <throat> your budget costs will rise 10 to 12 billion at and, the same and, time. And you don't know why? I've never been able to find out why. And I've studied it in great depth, but I've come to no conclusions as to why. So I think you have to point the finger at the Congress as being uh, the one that has made the monies available. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a very interesting thing, Mr. Buckley. I don't know whether you've studied the budget to this extent, but if we authorize for 72 fiscal year the amount of money that the president has asked us to authorize for spending, which is 249 plus billions, there will be available to the executive departments of government, counting the carryovers, slightly more than $500 billion authorized by Congress to be spent. So therefore, the thing to do is not to authorize it, right? I've been saying that we would end up uh, in 71 fiscal year and 72 fiscal year with a combined deficit of around 55.1 billion, uh, just two years, which is the largest for any two year period outside of World War II. Mm -hmm. But now the estimates are being revised. It looks more like $60 billion mm -hmm. for those two years. Well. You, you, you are uniquely situated to do something about it, right? Because uh, I have nothing to do. You, you can't have a deficit if you don't have an expenditure. I have nothing to do. You can't have an expenditure unless you approve it. Oh, yes, that's true. I have the uh, individual responsibility as a member of Congress. But the Ways and Means Committee has nothing to do with the initiation of appropriations. Mm -hmm. It used to have, before the Civil War, the combined responsibility of revenue and spending. But the spending part of it, the authorization for spending, is in the Appropriations yeah. Committee of the House and the Senate. And I'm not a member of that committee, but I'm not ducking my responsibility as an individual member of the Congress. Uh, I, too, am accountable for what the House has done. Uh, so maybe you, I haven't always been with the majority, and I haven't on many occasions. So your specialty, then, is to devise how to raise uh, the money That's that the Appropriations Committee tells you to raise. <clears throat> well, we're the tail of the dog. The body of the dog is the spending. Mm -hmm. You never seem in government to 
uh, cut your spending, uh, at our level of government at least, to your revenues. You always determine first what you want to spend. Mm. And then the tail <laughs> of the dog follows. And you may or you may not have a tax system that produces in that given year as much uh, as we spend. Now we've had about two years of balance uh, in, I've forgotten the exact number, but uh, uh, Johnson had one year on a unified basis. Eisenhower had a two, three. Eisenhower three. had uh, one or two. And Truman had a surplus one year. Truman had a surplus after the war one year. That's true, but now those are about all I can think of mm -hmm. uh, uh, during the time that I've been in Congress, and that dates from January 3, 39. Mm -hmm. uh, World War II came on immediately afterwards. And of course, it was utterly impossible in, at that time to have a balanced budget. Uh, it isn't, though, <coughs> uh, correct to say that the only time you can't have a balanced budget is when you have a war on your hands, because many of these years we've not had that. Yeah. And we've had very high levels of income, full employment. Still, we seem to be unable uh, to attract enough money to pay for the costs of the services that the Congress deems are necessary. Mm -hmm. Well, for those who, who are unsatisfied to continue to believe that that disparity is uh, either a mystery or a metaphysical necessity, uh, they, they are entitled to ask, aren't they, doesn't the regulation of the appetite have something Oh, yes, it, it, it's, it's, it's neither <clears throat> a mystery uh, or anything else. It's a fact, and it's a fact because I think our appetites are greater than our willingness to pay taxes. Well, now, what, 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 what's the kind of thing that you have done in virtue of your strategic uh, situation to talk to people about the necessity to regulate their appetites? Well, I've spent a great deal of time in uh, public discussion on the floor of the House, meetings that I attend regularly talking about the necessity sometime or other uh, of us uh, living within our means mm -hmm. rather than <clears throat> imposing upon future generations to take care of our own present desires. And that's really what we're doing. <clears throat> we're making it uh, more difficult, I think, for the generations that come after us. Well, how do you handle the New Deal axiom that we owe it to ourselves and therefore there well, is I've no imposition on the future generations? Never really agreed to that. Of course we owe it to ourselves and we are the government. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I don't think it's like uh, the individual taking a nickel out of one pocket and putting it into the other pocket. Uh, uh, these are obligations that we make, obligations that are a, a reflection of the full faith and credit of our government. If they're not <clears throat> redeemed, if they're not paid, uh, perhaps the government then is not uh, uh, really uh, uh, solvent. No, but what they tell you at school, or at least what they told me at school, was, look, it doesn't matter if you have a an enormous national deficit because let's say you got a thousand billion dollars owned, okay, you got a thousand billion dollars owed, but you got a thousand billion dollars that's owed to Americans. That's and true. therefore to the extent that you're poorer here, you're richer there, and the net situation ought to really inconvenience you. I, I had some of that same uh, teaching when I was in school. Mm -hmm. uh, it isn't exactly uh, accurate to say that our debt is not owned or not owed or owned altogether. Uh, by uh, American citizens. Well, who they are uh, all citizens of all, practically all the countries of the world, of the uh, Western world, uh, invest in our bonds. Uh, some of the banks abroad do so as well. Uh, but they're freely available to people throughout the world if they want them. And uh, I don't know what the percent is, but it's not uh, a small amount uh, in total dollars that uh, is invested in American bonds by people abroad outside the United States. It's one of the things we've encouraged somewhat uh, uh, in our struggles with our balance of payments. Uh, but basically, uh, the mere fact that uh, uh, these obligations are owed to ourselves is no excuse for completely brushing aside uh, our inability over the years uh, to be willing to produce that which we have wanted uh, in the way of services, the, the revenues to offset that. Uh, I, I'm not a believer in a balanced budget every year. That's utterly impossible. Yeah. Uh, I said years ago, and to my great uh, surprise, I had many converts to the idea that there should be a balance over a business cycle of 10 years because there you have your ups and your downs. Uh, but uh, too often, I think, uh, we've used the fiscal policy of our government uh, <clears throat> to try to determine uh, overall economic policies and positions uh, without too much regard as to what uh, the amount of the total 
deficit in a fiscal year might be. Now, well, I'm not saying that's not good because at times you have to do it. Well, do you sympathize, for instance, with the so-called full employment budget by I which Mr. Nixon has programmed a $20 billion deficit? I have a great deal of sympathy, sympathy under the present circumstances for a full employment budget. And I've said so publicly. The concept of a full employment budget is simple. If you do not spend more than you would take in in revenues, if you had a full employment economy, then you are not creating inflation. That's the theory of it. But uh, the sad part of it is, even with respect to the first such budget we've had submitted, we'll not be living within a full employment budget. 229.2 billion of spending pr uh, based upon 229.3 billion of revenues if we had no more than 4% unemployed is the present budget. But we will exceed considerably the 229.2 spending before mm -hmm. we get through. Mm -hmm. And we will not take in 229.3 billion, mm -hmm. nor even will we take in the <coughs> estimated revenues within the budget of some 217 billion, the 72 fiscal year. We're way off on those estimates. Well, what, um, what eventually happens in situations like this uh, uh, in inflation, the international depreciation of your currency, the lack of faith, uh, lack of stability, and so on and so forth. Uh, wh wh why is it to be preferred to, um, to have a deficit in a particular year as against, um, uh, as against uh, radical uh, uh, measures aimed at creating a stability which in turn encourages employment. But, uh, Mr. Buckley, you could create greater stability, I think, if in times of a recession or depression, you would gear your fiscal budget to a deficit. Mm -hmm. uh, but <clears throat> in times of inflation, we should strive to gear our budget uh, to a surplus uh, so that the effect uh, would be uh, to dampen the inflationary pressures rather than through the process of creating greater deficits and thereby putting oil on the uh, uh, inflationary pressures. Yeah. Now, this would be the, uh, correct in theory if we were looking at it only from that point of view. But, uh, but again, I, don't, I, I, I can't see us ever uh, really taking into consideration, as we should, uh, all of the many factors involved in the determination of fiscal policy, we look at too few of those factors. We find right now too much unemployment. Mm -hmm. So we decide that the way to correct that is to throw some money at the problem, and the problem will disappear. Now, I think the history of this country has clearly demonstrated that you get a whole lot less return uh, in uh, the development of jobs through government spending than you do in the emphasis uh, on the private sector uh, through some device through taxes or something other mm -hmm. uh, to do the equivalent mm -hmm. uh, job uh, creating. Mm -hmm. I've been a great believer always in a reliance upon the private sector uh, to move quickly into the creation of jobs. And the private sector is best lubricated by the reduction of taxes, I take it. Either that or some degree of incentive, such as we did in what the Kennedy the days, uh, the investment tax credit, yeah. I think the mere talk of it. Uh, President Kennedy was elected uh, and uh, campaigned on the idea of getting the economy going. Uh, I think in those years we did more to get the economy going in a satisfactory way without inflation uh, than uh, most any time uh, in our history. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a great believer in going back to see what history has indicated is a proper course or was a proper course then. Find out if it's a proper course today. I think it is. I'd much prefer <coughs> to stimulate the private sector right now to undo the um, unemployment we have than to continue to build up these massive programs of spending for that purpose. Now, I'm not talking about all spending, but for the purpose of creating jobs. Uh, first of all, if you do it through the tax system, you get a very quick effect on the economy. There's a great lag, however, if you do it through the spending part, uh, on the spending side. Uh, you may find the full effect of the spending program on down the road two years when you don't need the impetus mm -hmm. that you need now. Mm -hmm. uh, the same thing's true if you merely do what the administration did early in the year uh, through announcing changes in depreciation guidelines. That's over a period of time. But if you give uh, business this quick shot in the arm, it responds as it did in 62. Mm -hmm. Even the talk of it in 62 caused business to invest 
far more in capital goods than well, it would otherwise have done. Are, are, are you on record as advocating a reinstitution of this capital, uh, this investment credit? I am not. I'd like to find something really that we could substitute for it. If we got to the point, and I think there are things we can substitute for it that are just as effective, if we get to that, uh, that point, uh, I've been in agreement with uh, the Secretary of the Treasury and others in the administration that we would wait and see how the second quarter of this year compares with the first quarter, whether there has been enough upward thrust in the economy. You talking about the, fiscal year? No, I'm at, I'm at calendar year. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, see whether or not there's enough upward thrust in the economy on the basis of the present programs mm -hmm. or whether something additional needs to be done. And if we decide something additional has to be done, then we must determine what? where within our economy there needs to be this additional emphasis placed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think, actually, the great weakness in our economy right now is in the business sector. And with respect to the amount of money that it is investing uh, for purposes of the creation of jobs, there's not enough of it. Uh, there's not enough liquidity within business, uh, for one thing. Now, the second quarter may show a reasonably high level of profits, mm -hmm. uh, but it is not showing that reasonable high level of liquidity that's required. Uh, to instill in the business this incentive uh, to put more and more back into the business, that is to plow it back into new equipment, plow it back into new buildings and things of that sort. Why, why, uh, why do you continue to have a tax on foreign money invested here? Doesn't that seem a sort of a penny-wise thing to do? It drives away, well, it cuts down to somebody talking to zero uh, investment by wouldn't this be a way to repatriate we, uh, our euro dollars? Well, we, we have over the years uh, allowed people to uh, draw interest on bank savings accounts mm -hmm. here in the United States without paying uh, anything on those. Uh, some few years ago, we thought it was inequitable for a person abroad uh, to be treated far more favorably than an American citizen with respect to interest from a savings account. So we changed that. We changed it prospectively, however, to go into effect in 1975, as I remember. Mm -hmm. And it's done nothing in the world but cause uh, uh, us to receive estimates from savings and loan people, bank uh, account, uh, bankers with savings accounts, that if you don't prevent it from going into effect, all of these people with, will withdraw their savings. And that would have an adverse effect upon our balance of payment, of course, in addition. Mm -hmm. Now, what we will finally do, I don't know. But we were looking at it solely on the basis of equity. And a person abroad should not be given any more tax advantage under our laws with respect to investments in the United States than an American citizen should be given if you look solely at the question of equity. And that was our principal contention. Well, why not? Why not? Because after all, he's not using the American Marines or the uh, welfare or Social Security or whatever. So why we, should he we, have to pay we, for we it? We do give him a little bit of a break. It's mm -hmm. true with respect to what money he may earn uh -huh. while in the United States uh, as uh, a perhaps a resident but not a citizen of the United States. We do not tax him more than a flat 30 percent on his earnings mm -hmm. while here in the United States. But I doubt this provision we're talking about <coughs> earlier will ever be allowed to go into effect because uh, somebody will pull the trigger and uh, a lot of money will begin to evaporate and go back to Europe or somewhere else. We and, don't want uh, that. And we don't want that to happen, yeah. so we'll forego the equity of the situation yeah. and allow them to invest here uh, in savings accounts and get by without paying the tax. Uh, Mr. Bills, I was, I was um, messing around with some uh, figures uh, recently. and. Uh, I'd, I'd like to hear you comment, if you would, on uh, certain things that um, seem to speak to me uh, from that examination. Uh, we have, uh, we have uh, uh, I calculate, Missouri as more or less the, the average state, the typical state in terms of its uh, per capita uh, income. Its per capita income is $3,458. And uh, the highest is uh, New York, and the lowest is, uh, is Mississippi. Now, there are 23 states that earn less money than Missouri, just for the hell of it, let's call them the poorer states, and 26 that earn more than Missouri. Now, Missouri pays you, or pays the government, $502 million per year for various welfare things, and it gets back from the government 
of $500 million. So it's more or less a wash. Now, I wonder, what is the philosophy behind that round trip? Well, actually, we don't, uh, when we levy uh, our tax laws, we are not thinking really in terms of whether or not a corresponding spending program will return all of that money to the state. In your state of New York, I dare say that you pay in, in taxes perhaps eight times as much as you get back from the federal government. Uh, our whole system of uh, income tax uh, is predicated <clears throat> upon the individual's ability to pay, regardless of where he lives. This is an individual obligation, mm -hmm. uh, not as a citizen of Missouri, a citizen of uh, New York, but as a citizen of the United States. Uh, but we, a moment, a moment we ago, want him to pay on a <clears throat> basis. Now, a moment ago, you emphasized the virtues of decentralization, and uh, it would, would, wouldn't the the first step towards decentralization be not to, not to say, well, there's nobody poor in Missouri, but if Missouri is just getting back exactly what it's shoving out, why oughtn't Missouri legislators to decide on how to allocate the surplus? Well, because the uh, monies that you're talking about are raised by the federal government for the, in the first place. They're not monies that belong to a state or to a locality. They are extracted by the federal government <laughs> from people who live within localities. I'm glad they are extracted. extracted yeah. That's true. Yeah. They are extracted from American citizens and residents who live here in well, the United th States. They're extracted because that's the convention. But it's, it's your business as a legislator to look at conventions and decide which ought to be jettisoned and which ought to be retained. Well, I know of no better <clears> way <throat> to do it. Now, they, uh, not only is a citizen of Missouri a citizen of Missouri, but he's a citizen of the United States. Yeah. There are certain obligations that are owed under law to the uh, federal government no, as well as to the state of Missouri. Yeah, I don't think there's any point in telling you what the no. law is because you and I both know what the law is. The, the, the point is the law can change. Or it could change. Constitution. Frankly, I know no way to do it any different, for, that is, in any better way. Well, for, let, me, let me just suggest that. Suppose you were to say, suppose you were to encourage the following reform, namely that uh, beginning with the state of Missouri on up through the most expensive state, you won't send them any welfare money at all. Oh, I see your point. You're not thinking yeah. on tax side, you're thinking on the spending side. Yes, sir. Well, well now, let me give you an example there's a, of that. There's a loose correlation. I say, let me give you an example of that. Now, yeah. in the state of California, it's my recollection that the people of California pay about 11 percent of the federal taxes that are collected. 11.8, right. But on the other hand, <clears throat> the, uh, the uh, state of California gets about 14 percent of all of the federal dollars that are spent on welfare. 12.72. No, you're not taking into consideration Medicare, probably. Medicaid, I mean. Uh, maybe you are, but the figures I have are 11 and 14. We're not far uh -huh. apart. Mm -hmm. The point is that in California, in that one individual program, uh, they get back percentage-wise of the total of it more than they pay in uh, to the federal government as a percent of that total. Yeah. Uh, that's a state with a very high uh, per capita income, which would certainly be above the state of Missouri. Yeah. But it varies all over the lot. Uh, I know uh, the governor of the, the state of New York has called my attention on several occasions to the fact that the people in the state of New York, or at least the state of New York government, gets back a very small percent of what is collected by the federal government from that state. Uh, much, probably much uh, less percent than even in the state of California. Yes, although, um, although that is, that is a, you know, it, it, it's essentially true. It's nothing like eight times unless you, you count a, the, the cost of the army and so on. So I'm excluding that. I, say, I think that's an argument made for convenience. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Not good. But uh, uh, the, the, you, you, you do attach, I know, from your criticisms of President Nixon's uh, uh, approach, you attach a considerable importance to a relationship between the guy who spends money and the guy who taxes money. You, know, you think that the same guy uh, ought to be, well, that it, ought, it ought to be the same guy where possible if, uh, if I'm governor of New York and I spend a billion dollars, I, as governor of New York, ought to urge the raising of a billion dollars. Put it this way. I look at it more as my own responsibility mm -hmm. as a member of a committee that has the, uh, the responsibility of uh, adjusting the levels of taxation. Uh, should I uh, impose a tax upon the citizens of my state or any other state or the nation as a whole and not at the same time determine how that individual's money is to be spent. But say that I don't care. I'll just pass that responsibility off to someone else to make that determination. I think the two have to go together. Yeah. And I feel very strongly that uh, you don't get better government uh, at any level uh, uh, if you split these two responsibilities, because there is uh, this joint responsibility, I think.
to raise that which you spend and to spend that which you raise. Well, that being the case, if you, if you, if you start off with a state uh, whose income is above the national average, New York, say, California, any state above Missouri, uh, what is the philosophical argument in the light of what you say against saying to them, okay, gentlemen, uh, we're not going to give you anything for Medicare or any of these uh, various services. Uh, we're going to concern ourselves only with the more impoverished 23 states, which means, of course, that we're going to need a hell of a lot less money from you. We're not going to take $502 million from Missouri in order to return $500 million to Missouri. And this frees up an awful lot of money and makes it possible for the people in those states speaking to much more responsive legislators because the ratio to legis from legislator to voter is much less to, uh, to uh, custom make a welfare program to their liking rather than relying on Washington, D.C., a, a foreign capital in the case of Missouri. Mr. Buckley, it might work in theory, but as a practical matter, I doubt we'd ever see the day when we'd pass such uh, an yeah, arrangement. Yeah, well, tell me why. Well, we did, wouldn't have enough votes. Your poorer states the, uh, that we say we call them for sake of another name, mm -hmm. the 23 of them, uh, getting most of the benefit of the expenditure of federal funds under such a program just would not have the votes to pass such a program. But they're getting it anyway. No, they, uh, they get more than they uh, return, that's true. Yeah. Uh, but uh, well, you take Miss Mississippi gets about... Uh, if, if you look at the per capita distribution, uh, it, uh, it's not as uh, far out of line as uh, one might think. Well, New, you, you send back to New York $140 per capita, you send Missouri 125 bucks per capita, and you send Mississippi $200 per capita. Now, the, the point I'm trying to make is, uh, an awful lot of attitudes are struck as a result of the universal ignorance of what it is that actually goes on. Now, there'd be an awful lot of people in Missouri less enthusiastic about federal welfare measures for which they uniformly vote if they understood that they were simply voting to take money out of their own pockets, send it to New York for a very expensive trip out on the town, and then back into their own pockets, what's left well, of it. Well, in the welfare program, I'm not certain just exactly what the percent in Missouri is, but it probably is more than 50 percent federal money at the, uh, uh, based upon the income you quoted. Uh, certainly in the state of Mississippi, uh, our matching formulas for AFDC and uh, the adult programs uh, would be uh, near 80 percent uh, as uh, possible uh, because of the variable grant formula that we have in the welfare program. We say that no state will get less than 50 percent federal. Uh, it can run all the way from 50 up to a maximum of 83, but it never quite, get, never quite gets to 83. Uh, maybe 79 or 80 in Missouri. Well, I, I, I mean yeah, in Mississippi. Yeah, I'm giving you consolidated figures. Uh, yeah. um, M M Mississippi provides 0.54 percentage of the welfare money and receives 1.76. So they're about three and a half times better off than they were when they started. I don't dispute it. But what yeah. I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, why, why wouldn't it be popular among the richest states as among the poorest states uh, to vote for a system which actually clarifies what it is that's going on oh, so that they can express their cultural preferences? And, uh, I'm not opposed to that. I'm not but opposed wouldn't to this that. be the ideal way to do it? Any way we can clarify the situation, wouldn't I think this, we should do it. Wouldn't this be an ideal way to do it to relieve Congress of the responsibility of redundant welfare? If, uh, uh, if I get your point, are you, are you saying that we should uh, make it possible for the federal funds that would be collected in New York for a specific purpose to remain in that state uh, for whatever purpose, uh, uh, particularly that particular well, that, that's one? That's the so-called piggyback state. scheme, yeah. where New York that's would right. instruct you, please right. give us 12 percent or 10 percent or 8 percent or 7 percent. That's right. That's, a, that's certainly a reform. Oh, it's a definite reform, yeah. and I think would go a long ways toward uh, changing the whole uh, mm. Uh, 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 composition of the state tax systems, yeah. uh, because if they say they want 12 and a half percent of what we take from the person within that it's state, it's easy to that's calculate. A, just an extra line on the tax return. Right, right. And right. if we raise our taxes here, then their taxes automatically go yeah, up, yeah, and they're yeah. saved the necessity of that. Except every, every year, the legislature ha would have to give internal. As I understand it, I should understand because I thought it up about 10 years ago. But the, uh, as I understand it, the legislature each year would instruct the oh, yes. Revenue oh, Service sure. Sure. how much take. If they That's want 12.5% right. this year or 12% next year or 13%. Or on a biannual basis. Yeah. yeah. They could do but, that. But add to this the following uh, absolute sunburst of mine, which is why bother to patronize 26 states whose 
per capita income is above the national average. Why don't you let them do it themselves? Well, I say if that's your point. Uh, it so that's could, my it, second point. It could be done, but I just don't see that <laughs> such a program would ever have a possible chance. Would you vote for it? I don't know. I doubt it. Why? Quite frankly, I doubt it. Uh, from some source, the federal treasury must collect the money that we want to use over and above what the 23 states pay in yeah. in order to assist them. Now, where will we get that if we give back to the 26 states all that we collect within the 26 states yeah. to do with as they see fit rather than have us make the determinations in Washington? That'd now, that means that the poorer states wouldn't have anything left yeah. except what we'd collect off of them. Yeah, but I'm not suggesting that, you see. I'm suggesting that you leave off the 26 states and say, therefore, instead of, instead of $31 billion in categorical grants, which is roughly the yeah. figure for this year, we, we only need uh, uh, $10 billion because we, we're going to concern ourselves with the poor states, not with the rich states. Therefore, the tax that you raise goes way down, and there is therefore generated a surplus within the state for it to tax as it, see, as it sees fit. I misunderstood you. You're talking about the revenues as they relate to a specific program. Yeah. And that specific program, we might say, is not mm. necessary in New York. Yeah. Thus, if it's not necessary in New York, we'll give the state of New York what we would have otherwise given the state of New York under that particular program. Well, you'll give, New you'll give the state of New York nothing. Oh, really? You'll simply, ta see. you'll simply tax New York to help Mississippi and all those other oh, 23 states, which you do anyway. We do that anyway. Which you do yeah. that anyway. Yeah. But you're going to call what you do by what you do. By but what is, you do. Uh, what's New York to gain? Uh, well, New, 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 York, New York is to other gain than to lose. Sovereignty, <laughs> sovereignty over its own affairs. All of a sudden, the people in New York find that they got about uh, two and a half billion dollars, which you haven't uh, conscripted. And with that two and a half billion dollars, they can go ahead and tax via that other formula sure. that we talked about. Or do anything. And they do it any way they want. I mean, they, they, they might be. For instance, you, you're not concerned over, let's say, helping out people who earn more than $50,000 a year, are you? Oh, yes, they need more help than those of us uh, well, from less from, sometimes. Uh, yeah, from, from their <laughs> priests, but not from their legislators. Well, I guess I'll agree with you. <laughs> yeah. uh, and and, and, and by, by that uh, token, since it, since it is, and you, you quoted Abraham Lincoln last night in New York City, that uh, the task of government is to do that which people can't do for themselves or as well. Uh, uh, under that dispensation, why should you concern yourself using the metaphor with people whose income is $50,000 or more. Why should people in New York State need your advice on how to look after their welfare problems? What they need is the money that you're taking from them. Well, they not only need the money we take from them, but <clears> they're <throat> anxious to get more back from us all the time, too. Yeah, because, because uh, they're wired into this illusion. I guess. And, uh, <laughs> I guess. For instance, for instance you, you take, I remember in one election in New York State, I'd be interested in your psychological commentary on this, in one election in New York State, the very same people voted for two sets of legislators. They sent one set down to Washington, and they instructed them to vote for federal aid to education. And they sent another set to Albany and said not to raise school taxes. Mm -hmm. Now, this is incoherent, isn't it? Oh, because that they, they ended up taking three times as much money out of their own pockets to improve the school system as they would have gotten if they had told the people in Washington to vote no and the people in Albany to vote yes. The only explanation, uh, and I've said this about my own state, it no, goes. no, they've expressed their desire. Sometimes it's difficult to understand uh, just what motivates that desire, but in my own state, you probably recall, in 1968, we elected a governor of one party, a senator of another party, and the state uh, cast its uh, uh, vote for president of a third party. So uh, this has been unheard of in my state, but the people did it, uh, and uh, I don't think there was any well, they could, uh, they, lack they, of information involved in it. They were just motivated. No, that, that could be a personal thing. Yeah. I mean, you could vote for, for Bing Crosby and Bob Hope and sons of and uh, John Wayne, if they John were, Wayne. Uh, sure, they were. They were. They were. elected. There you are. Sure, <laughs> but uh, but when 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 you, when you vote for people and in effect give them contradictory mandates isn't the easiest explanation that they really didn't understand. Well, I, it's a little difficult that for me to say that. That education isn't going to come out of your pocket. It's a little difficult for me to, uh, to say that now because uh, I'm talking about my own constituents. On some occasions, I've uh, received uh, resolutions from some of the very conservative groups within my district urging me not to be for any additional spending program, but to cut back drastically on those programs we have. And then the next few days, stop this agency from cutting back mm -hmm. these four jobs in our community that are threatened. These are four very fine families, very yeah, yeah. fine men yeah. and women. Just don't let them cut back. 
So the inconsistency there cannot be explained by ignorance on the part of these very highly educated, sophisticated business people. Well, people tend to be extremely ingenious uh, in showing how their uh, problems are an exception. Right? Oh, well, oh, my goodness, yeah. we're all that. Whether, it, whether it's the tariff or the, or the labor union right. that wants a monopoly. That's right. And so, so. But isn't it your job, not only as a legislator, but as an educator, always to be reminding them that uh, this is a human frailty and that your responsibility rather transcends. Well, I do spend a little bit of time reminding them of the fact that we have more than just their single interest to, to consider when we do something. We must think in terms of the public interest. Yeah. yeah. Mr. Pullman. Um, Congressman Mills, um, part of the rationale between um, uh, your uh, alternative program for 3.5 billion for the cities. Uh, let me stop you there. I, I really don't have an alternative program. What I have said is that I am fully convinced uh, that at least some of our cities, some of our local levels of government counties uh, are in dire financial circumstances and I'm perfectly willing to help them on the basis of need. Now how much it would cost, I don't know. But this was reported uh, actually, I think, uh, by those who were in a meeting that I attended, only a very few minutes, and the meeting went on for an hour and a half. But I did say that the cities that I know about have some very severe problems, plus some of the local levels of government. Uh, but I could not see that the states had anything like uh, greater financial problems than the federal government has. Now, let me just, uh, pardon okay, me for interrupting but, but Would you say that, um, that you would, you know, be more in favor, along with, um, you know, a lot of the other Democrats, of giving more help to the cities uh, from the point of view that the Nixon revenue sharing program kind of, uh, you know, gives them short shrift in relation to, say, you know, the suburbs and the other areas. Would you actually, say that's actually, actually, the many things about the uh, President Nixon's proposal that we don't like, uh, the money is not divided 50-50 between the states and cities and local governments. In my own uh, state, for instance, the state would get of its part of all that goes into the state about 64 uh, uh, percent. Uh, the cities and the counties would get 36 percent. But in some other states, uh, the cities uh, will get, say, 48 percent and the state 52 percent. It varies over the lot. Uh, that, uh, uh, that's beside the point. Uh, what we're trying to do versus what President Nixon's program does is to get dollars, if we're to send dollars to any level of local government, where there is the need for those dollars and not have one community within a state because it has a wide tax base due to the industrial commercial complex or the wealth of the individual citizens living within it uh, because it can raise more money, get more money than another community of like size can get which doesn't have that broad tax base. Now this, uh, but that's a question of the formula that they've worked out which omitted any question of need. Uh, we do think in terms of limiting the purpose for which these monies can be spent by cities, which eliminates the no-strings-attached uh, objection that I have. Still, I can't find any way to get around another objection I have, and that is that we don't really have any revenues to share with anyone. All we can do is just borrow more money. Ms. Uh, Miljevic? Yes. Is it possible to lower the federal income tax and raise the state and city taxes, would that alleviate yes, the that, problem? That is one of the suggestions pending before the committee, uh, namely that we cut back uh, on our level of income tax to the individuals right. in the hopes that the state and cities uh, would uh, take over that uh, amount of money through upward adjustment of their income taxes. But the weakness of the whole thing is that don't all states have uh, the income tax, and uh, not all states allow cities uh, to levy uh, uh, an income tax. There'd have to be an awful lot of adjustments made within the states and the laws dealing with cities before they could uh, recoup that money. Uh, right now, if we did it, in all probability, it would result in a tax reduction uh, for uh, those paying federal income tax, but little likelihood in the immediate future that they'd pay more into the state as a result of what we've done. I just wonder if that's more problem than shuffling the money from the 
federal taxes back through the government and then back to the state. Oh, yes, there's no greater problem than that latter. <laughs> Mr. Beer. Thank you. Congressman Mills, from your privileged position as chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, I was wondering what your uh, prediction would be right now on the future of the whole Nixon revenue sharing package. Well, the Nixon revenue sharing package will not uh, be reported by the Ways and Means Committee. I've been only able to detect uh, uh, four solid votes, possibly two or three more votes within the committee for his plan. Out of how many? Uh, out of 25. Mm -hmm. With all the T's dotted, I mean crossed and the I's dotted, uh, everybody, including those who would vote for it, say that the formula has to be changed. They're all impressed with the haphazard method by which the money is distributed, particularly to the cities and local levels of government. Uh, there, are, uh, there are alternatives, I think. Uh, that the committee uh, will consider and report. I'm not in a position yet to discuss those alternatives because, frankly, there's so many before us, and I've had no opportunity to really get uh, an evaluation of the committee's reaction to each and every one of these uh, alternatives. But the piggyback uh, idea that uh, we discussed earlier, uh, Mr. Buckley mentioned, I think very definitely would be in whatever package we report. I think finally there'll be some type of a, a grant in aid program uh, for the cities to cover some of the costs uh, of the operation of cities uh, that uh, uh, the cities have difficulty in fully meeting now. For instance, we may want to look to see uh, if they take care of the sanitation problems within a city, if they take care of the uh, fire and health and uh, uh, police uh, situation properly. Maybe they need a little bit more money for a half a dozen or a dozen different things. Uh, but we would, I think... And the mayors. Uh, uh, well, the mayors say that, yeah. But we would limit whatever we do, I think, to a very specific set of areas, uh, such as the president's $11 billion uh, does. Uh, we say there, where it can be spent within these six areas, you use your judgment as to how much within each of the six areas or within uh, what areas you want to spend it. You can say you uh, can have a new sewer or nothing. That, well, that's right. You can have the sewer if you want it, if that's the primary problem within the city. Or if you need more police, uh, put on more police. If you need more sanitation uh, people, uh, put on more sanitation people. If you need more firemen, put on more firemen. Whatever it is, but do it within the areas that we say. And I think we would restrict them against the use uh, of the money for uh, education because some cities have to carry the cost of education, others do not. And then we would create the unfair situation of helping with respect to education in one area and not helping with respect to it in another. They may limit it too to not provide for monies for uh, some kind of a new building or something of that sort, a physical uh, facility. So would you say that the president's plan as it stands now that he's been trumpeting across the country is just going to die a quiet death in your committee? Well, the reaction that I've gotten from the people throughout the country clearly justifies me saying yes, and I think that is the answer I would give you completely, uh, because the mail has been overwhelmingly opposed to this idea, except from those people who are elected to some public office at a, lower, a local level. I'm talking about the state capital downward. They are all for it. You're, you're saying that the people who write to you object to non-categorical grants? Oh, this un no strings attached. Uh, they don't like that? Oh, no, they do not. The mail is overwhelming, coming to me individually and to the committee. Uh, well, why don't these overwhelming people go ahead and accept them and then tell their legislators how to spend it? I don't know, but uh, I'm just telling you their reaction is, is opposed to it. They, uh, they envision it finally as meaning more taxes, I think. Mm -hmm. Frankly, I, I do. See. Uh, and sometime or other, if we ever had a balanced budget, it would mean more taxes. Maybe yeah. not tomorrow, but uh, sometime down the road, you have to collect money to pay interest. Yeah. And at the rate we're going, we may have to raise taxes to pay interest. When? It couldn't be too far down the road. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Pullman? Yeah, um, I hate to return to this, to the role That's of the right. suburbs, but I'm going anyway. <laughs> um, uh, Kevin Phillips, who writes a column now, um, we used to work for President Nixon before he was elected. Um, has a theory that the suburbs under the revenue sharing plan um, will incur, incur a dollar loss in this plan. In other words, that the suburbs will kick in a high percentage because of the, you know, the tax base and get, you know, relatively peanuts in return. And he says, like, he lists a lot of examples, and he said that, for instance, San Francisco and Oakland uh, in the city, I mean, uh, in the city, the people will get per person $13.20, whereas the suburbs 
around there will get back 904. And that's just an example. He had a lot of examples. I was wondering, uh, with regards to this, you know, do you agree with this, his yes, reasoning? But you, yes, I do, but you can show just the reverse. It depends upon the particular suburb that we're talking about. Uh, Lakewood, Ohio, for instance, I understand, I've never been there, uh, is a, a suburb of considerable wealth. Uh, you may know, I don't. Uh, but uh, Lakewood, Ohio, uh, well, they just haven't been there. <laughs> Lakewood, Ohio, however, would get more uh, per capita than some other adjoining city would get, say, in Ohio uh, per capita because of the difference in the taxes collected within the two communities. That is really the fundamental weakness uh, at the city level in the distribution formula. I mean, if uh, there's a big disparity, it, it polarizes that disparity. Sure it does. Uh, the poor remain poor, them that has it just gets more, if you pardon my expression. Mm -hmm. That's not collegiate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Miljevic? Did, did he answer your question, uh, Ms. Pullman? The, 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 did I, if I didn't ask? Because feel free to... Uh, no, you answered it. The, <laughs> Ms. Mills, <laughs> If I understand it correctly, Mr. Mills, um, the suburbs will not necessarily get back less than they put in through taxes because the formula will not be based solely on tax distribution. It is, a, it is pardon me, it is at the local level on taxes collected at the state level, uh, it's tax effort. But when it gets to the city or county, it's what you collect per capita, you see. Your population and your taxes collected are the formula right. for the city to get its money. Is this your formula? No, no, this is uh, the Nixon. Oh, the Nixon, talking about Nixon. Right? Nixon yeah. formula. The one you were rejecting. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't government expenditure enter into it at some point? It should, uh, not government, but local. I'm not talking about federal government. You mean local government. It should, and that brings in your element of need. Uh, a face up to the situation, I think all of us recognize that one of the problems, say, in the larger uh, metropolitan area is the movement from within the inner city out to the suburb of those who are more affluent and into their place after you go through this series and series of moves one to a better apartment, to a better apartment, and so on. Uh, you bring in p uh, people of less affluence, finally. And thus, your tax base within that city has been reduced. But you find at the same time that the costs of city government are greater dependent upon the economic status of the average person within that city. Now, the lower that level is, the more are your costs of city government. So we find the cities in the position, and that's why I say I'm so anxious to see that we do something to help them. We find them in this, pro uh, in this almost insurmountable predicament of trying as hard as they can, but finding their costs way outrunning their tax receipts. The tax receipts actually may be contracting uh, in some instances, but the costs are always running out. Uh, they need some help now, temporarily at least, until something can be done by federal, state, or local city governments to bring about some change in the direction in which they're moving and some cure. Mr. Beer. Yes, a little while ago, Mr. Mills, you were talking about how quickly results can be realized by putting money into the private sector. I was wondering if in a revenue sharing program you could envision some of that shared revenue going not only into, say, public works or welfare, but also directly into the private sector, perhaps for manpower development? Well, we do that now. I don't know how effective, uh, or I don't, I don't mean how effective, it's effective, but I don't know to what, I don't recall the dollar amount. But one of the most effective training programs is this so-called on-the-job training. That's done within the private sector, where a man untrained works side by side with people who are trained. And in the process of their helping him, uh, he becomes, uh, uh, an artisan much quicker, they tell me, than if you just sit him down in the classroom and teach him uh, from a book or something of that sort. Uh, we do that. I don't know, I, I may be missing your point. Uh, what I was talking about was the creation of job opportunities within the private sector versus the making of jobs through federal spending. And you get a reaction from the creation of those jobs within the private sector, I think, much quicker 
and more uh, organic and more organic yeah. than you do through spending these monies in, the, in an effort to create some job somewhere that may be good from the public interest or it may not be so good from the public interest. Well, Mr. Bills, let me uh, spend the last uh, a couple of minutes in asking you uh, to comment on a few more propositions that are ally allied to uh, what you've been talking about here. We recognize now that um, the cities are in crisis, right? Well, now, isn't the countryside also? Uh, yeah, oh crisis? yes, I, I don't want to overlook that. I, I, I've been accused of just trying to develop something for the benefit of the cities and overlook uh, the countryside. Mm -hmm. But there's just as much poverty, probably, on a percentage basis in any area of the United States as there is in some other area. Mm -hmm. You've got it in the rural areas just like we have it in the cities. Yeah. Uh, there's just not as many of them because there's just not as many people living in those rural areas. But percentage-wise, it's a big problem and a, and a sizable percent. Well, no, why, you can't why, why, is the, why is the accent at this point then on helping the cities? Well, that's, that's a bit mistaken in the reporting that's been going on. I've said all along that I wouldn't undertake to pass a bill that just helped New York City. I couldn't get enough votes to do it. Mm -hmm. And I'd be criticized severely for overlooking the similar problems that existed within my own uh, state, in the rural areas of my own state. No, it has to be uh, for counties and cities and towns. Now, I, I don't even want to draw a line uh, at 25,000, as some people have suggested. Below that, nobody gets any help. Mm -hmm. Now, I can envision uh, a county with 6,000 people and it having such a small tax base that it has far more difficulty mm. than a city of 200,000 <clears> would have in raising revenues. Yeah, yeah. And therefore, you propose to do what? And what I would do is to help the cities and help the counties and localities, and not the state governments, because I can't, I just can't bring myself to believe that any state, New York City or New York State or Arkansas or any other state, is in such dire financial circumstance uh, as to justify the federal government, which I think is in worse shape financially, of dishing out additional borrowed dollars, creating more inflation in the process, which they, would have, to from, which they would have to get from the states in the first place. Oh, certainly. We've got to go back sometime or other and get it from the people within the states. Yeah. The same people pay the taxes, whether they be property taxes, whether they be sales taxes at state level or federal income yeah. taxes. We're taxing the same people. Now, what, what do you say about the argument uh, that uh, the, the rush to the cities is something which we are synthetically encouraging by the kind of attention that we have given financially and, and otherwise to the cities, and that therefore we have a hand in manufacturing the crisis which we now sit down and deplore. Uh, 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 isn't it possible that since 70% of Americans live in 2% of the land, that this, this drive towards urbanization ought precisely not to be encouraged. Uh, Absolutely. That, and that under the circumstances, one, one shouldn't uh, invest billions of dollars in the cities in order, in, in order to make them all look like Hong Kong, when there's so many areas of America in which people could live better and more wholesome lives. I, I, I think, basically, a person leaves wherever he live, uh, lives to go to another place in the hopes of uh, bettering his economic situation. Now, he may make a mistake in doing it, but I think somebody may write him and tell him, in the city, here's a job. Mm -hmm. By the time he gets to the city, the job's taken by someone else. He may then have to go on welfare if he lives. Uh, but your point is well taken, and I think there is some justification for the, uh, for the charge that perhaps the federal government has been a party to this. Say that we don't provide desirable housing in a rural area, we provide, we provide it within a city. And the individual finds he doesn't have the proper housing within the rural area. That may be an incentive to get him to move to mm -hmm. the city to get that better housing. Now, we started way back in President Kennedy's day of trying to build into the rural areas what we referred to as the modern conveniences that one enjoyed living in a city. In other words, central water, mm -hmm. central sewers, and things of that sort, with low rent housing available within these areas of low income, um, uh, low population. Which program was this? Uh, the low rent housing uh, uh, was extended, I think. Uh, I've forgotten just when it was. But we've extended it now to where a town can get it, mm -hmm. of a thousand or less. They can have a low rent housing project for uh, the elderly or for the low income person. But that was not available earlier. We didn't have the central water, central sewer uh, programs that 
have proven so effective, in my opinion. For instance, within my own district, there are people that work within Little Rock and North Little Rock uh, in industry or in business who live uh, maybe 20, 30, or even 40 miles away in a smaller community. Mm -hmm. Now, I doubt that they'd continue to live that far away from their job if there were not the conveniences that they desire within this smaller community, such as water and sewer, available to them. Mm -hmm. I think they'd move into the city. Now, they're not uh, going to harm the city if they do it because they're able to pay taxes and all. But uh, others might who were not as able to pay taxes as these that I'm talking about who work. Well, whatever happened to the, the market function? I mean, uh, it, it seems to me that if, if Congress is going to have to uh, um, take the metabolism of the sewers all over the country in order to try to get people to move just in the right direction, you're A, going to be extremely busy, and, and we're B, going to be extremely them. unsuccessful. We're trying to keep them from moving. That's all we're trying to do, is to provide a degree of comfort within the rural area that is not there. Let well, them pay us back over a 40-year loan period uh, and just see if, uh, if we can't hold some people within the rural areas that otherwise would be leaving it. Now, if we hold one half the population, we've succeeded to that extent. Yeah, and but I you think are, we have. you're spending 600% as much as in 1960 in programs of this general nature, and everybody's, everybody's squawking more than they were even 10 years ago. That's right. And the crises seem to have become more acute everywhere. Has it occurred to you to simply not spend the money and allow market forces themselves oh, yes. to, to assert themselves so that people go uh, where they can, let's say, hang on to more savings and describe the way in which they want to spend their own surplus instead of having the government spend it for them. I think that's the one factor that uh, keeps us from spending a lot less, I mean, a lot more than we're presently spending on a lot more different kind of programs, is the very desire to let this operate to the extent that it can within what we've already done. Well, do you think that the democratic platform, let's say, of 10 years from now, is one that will seek to retrench welfare and to encourage people, as for instance is being done now in Sweden, to uh, have voluntary, there's, as you know, there's a movement in yeah. Sweden to have people pay taxes on a voluntary basis if they want to exchange this particular service for their taxes, which is really the old free enterprise idea. That's right. That's, might, really, that's really free enterprise, isn't it? <laughs> well, it, it is, in a sense. Isn't it? But, but do, 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 do you see us headed towards a position in which it is simply impossible to finance more than in fact is being provided. Yes, without uh, the obligation to borrow us darn much more that we'll not be able to properly handle our debt. Yeah. That's the whole point about the debt is the size of it can get out of hand to the extent that we can't even handle it. Now, when you're talking Thank you very much, Mr. Mills. I'm sorry. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, members of the panel. printed copy of this program, send 25 cents to Firing Line, Post Office Box 5966, Columbia, South Carolina, 29205. That address again, Firing Line, Post Office Box 5966, Columbia, South Carolina, 29205. This program was made possible by a grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. This is PBS, the Public Broadcasting Service.